So we've been doing a whole lot with colorants and specifically FD&C colorants within all of this. And it does make me feel a little bit weird, like an imposter syndrome type thing, because I very rarely use FD&C colorants. But because so many of you do, I wanted to give you relatable stuff within you know your world. I, however, prefer to use micas. And so that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on while still making some bath bombs using FD&C colorants but talking about the other ways that you can color your bath bombs so you can find a way and a coloring structure that works right for you. And I will tell you more about that, even though I don't know how I could possibly do more than that rather succinct summary. Wow, look at me go in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for week 26 of year three and uh, Bath Bomb Back to Basics video number six of at least an eight part series. And we're going to be talking about colorants and how you use them. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is because early on in the, the channel, I was doing this and I would you know give recipes and talk about it and give you the pro tips and whatever. And I would say, literally within the video that I'm using, you know, Micah's cut with cornstarch or whatever. And I never failed. I would still get comments down there that were like, that's way too much Micah. And I'm like, you literally, clearly, obviously did not listen to the video because while it can look like a lot of Micah, I cut my Micah's with cornstarch. And so I thought it would be a good idea to kind of go over why I cut my Micah's with cornstarch, what other colorants I use or can be used for bath bombs and sort of the consequences of all of that. So that's what we will be doing today while making a six color bomb using FD&C colorants. It's all a thing, it's all a journey. We're gonna have a good time. Let's get to the video and we can do all of that. Okay, so this is actually perfect because I totally messed up this batch in that I forgot that I was using, you know, dyes, FD&C colorants, and not using my micas. And so as a result, what went into all of this is the standard, you know, oil, scent, and water into the baking soda. And usually with all of this, if I'm using my micas, I, that's fine because my micas are cut with cornstarch and you can get the whatever. It's all thing. Anyway, as a result, I ended up with too much water in this batch because uh, there was the one tablespoon of total water into the whole batch plus the colorants. And as you can see, they're very, very bright. And I added, I don't know, about half a tablespoon in totality of water to each different section to get the colors all nice and bright and beautiful. And so I noticed that the batch was a little bit too wet. So what I am doing before I'm putting the citric acid in is I'm adding a little bit more baking soda to each of these to dry out the batch so I don't end up with bath bombs that are going to expand or get warts or start to sort of like sploosh out of their, you know, little carriers that I, I put them in. Yeah, it's all a thing. So that's a, a good thing that you get to see. The batch is overly wet, not as as dry as I would want because it really is all about the moisture content with all of this and I think that I'm going to be doing maybe it's a members only video uh, where we talk about just the moisture content and I show you what I do to test the moisture content it's a weird one that's why I'm going to make it probably a members only because the members will appreciate it and the whole entire internet I don't know they might laugh at me anyway point is I usually use micas for all of this because I don't go for the big, you're going to change the color of the tub 
water, you know, thing very often. Didn't do that. And so I had to adjust the batch before I started making the bombs because I knew as soon as I put that citric acid in, whew, it was going to start getting real cold, real uh, wet. It was going to be a problem. So I added some extra baking soda to each of these to ensure that I did not end up with overly wet bath bombs. And uh, now I am put the, putting the citric acid in and mixing everything up and getting ready to mold a six color bath bomb. Now, to the micas, how I usually use micas, because there are other ways to color your bath bombs. Typically, I use micas and I will put a full, I have these containers that hold six ounces by weight of, you know, powdered ingredients, they're like shakers. And I will put a full ounce by weight of mica, whatever color I'm using, that is approved for bath bombs. You do need to pay attention to that though. There are a lot of bath bomb colorants that are not, well, there are a lot of micas that are not approved for bath bombs, namely your blues and your greens because they have the ultramarine in there. Now, with this, I put one full ounce of the mica into that container and then I fill it the rest of the way up, so five ounces of cornstarch into each. Now the reason that I put the micas into cornstarch, I cut them with cornstarch, is realistically because it makes it a lot easier to incorporate the color into the bath bomb mixture when you use cornstarch to sort of like help disperse the colorant throughout the entire batch. It just gets so annoying if you're just putting straight mica into your baking soda and trying to mix it around. It takes so much longer. I don't know what it is, but if I essentially color the cornstarch and put it in, then it makes it much easier. You don't have to use cornstarch. You can also use arrowroot powder. You could use kale and clay. Those are both great, but mine typically get cut with cornstarch and then has the added benefit of putting a little bit of the dry ingredients like we talked about in the last video into the bath bomb for stability to make sure that they harden faster so you're not going to be you know coming in contact or having problems with your uh, bath bombs getting overly wet from the humidity in the environment or you know just generally making sure that it's a stable hard smooth bomb that will have a nice long fizz so that's why i do that but with the micas, you can, as I said, put them in directly. It just takes a lot longer to mix them in. So I would kind of recommend against that just because I, you know, I like things to be faster, really. Now, when I use the micas, I you've seen a bajillion videos of that. I use quite a bit. I would say around two to four tablespoons of micas, just kind of shaking them into the colorant. Again, once they are dispersed within the cornstarch, so the one ounce of the micas to the five ounces of cornstarch. And I understand that that might be a confusing thing to you right now that I am working in weights when I have just been giving you volume measurements throughout all of that. Here's the thing. The reason why I give you volume measurements for all of this is because I'm trying to create a universal recipe that can be used across the board, right? And have a, a way to easily substitute things. So giving you weights of like, what is the equivalent of two cups of baking soda? Well, that's 25 ounces, right? What is the equivalent of one cup of citric acid? Well, that's 10 ounces, right? What is the equivalent of one half cup of cornstarch or arrowroot or kaolin or whatever? Well, that's different. That is also that right there is showing you just how wet this bath bomb powder is. Do you see that? That's that. That's a lot. That's that's, that's very damp, right there. And we are still making excellent bath bombs, but we are going to run into a few problems with them separating because they are a little bit too wet, as I will show you in all of this. But anyway, back to the cornstarch, the arrowroot, the kale and clay, other things that you could put in SLSA, SCI. Those all have different weight measurements. And when you are working at really the moisture content, that's the really important thing with all of this. So how damp your overall bath bomb mixture is, it's easier to work in a volume measurement because you are measuring the, the dry ingredients to the liquid ingredients. And if I am just saying a half of a cup of you know SLSA or kale and clay or arrowroot or cornstarch, then that same amount of dry ingredient is going in, 
right, by volume. If I were to give you a measurement by weight, well, that changes quite a bit, right? Because like a uh, half of a cup of cornstarch, that's 2.4 ounces. Half of a cup of arrowroot would be 2.8 ounces. SLSA, also 2.8. SCI, also 2.8. Kale and clay, half of a cup would be 1.4 ounces. So if I were to give you an overall measurement of like 10% of the total batch weight, so like 3.5 ounces, or just sticking with the cornstarch weight, 2.4 ounces, you're ultimately going to be adding different amounts of the dry ingredients. And again, when you're really focused on the overall moisture content of the recipe to ensure that you have, you have a good bath bomb consistency, so they're going to be successful, that makes it you know kind of off you're going to end up with a drier bath bomb if you're using kaolin over you know the cornstarch because you have to use quite a bit more kaolin than cornstarch in the recipe to equal that total weight does that make sense so it makes it harder for you to do substitutions for an ingredient that effectively does the same thing because cornstarch arrowroot and kaolin they all do basically the same thing within a bath bomb and when you're dealing with like SLSA and SCI, well, because they are so similar th with what they are doing as well, kind of the same. It's not something that is, I don't find it to be valuable to be, you know, weighing things out as opposed to the volume measurements for bath bomb making. Because again, it's not an exact science. This is more of a feel thing. And so it kind of goes back to old school bread makers or tortilla makers or biscuits, you know, with my grandmother and my mother and all of the things. And we just do things by feel. You, you mix a little bit more water into your, you know, biscuits until it has the right consistency to continue. Or you mix a little bit more flour into it if it's a little bit too sticky so you get all of the things. And so that's why I do volume measurements as opposed to weight within all of this. I do think it's going to lend to more people being able to substitute and really work through the batch easier than doing the actual weights because in then in that case, you're kind of dealing with a whole bunch of different recipes and it's not a universal, it's no longer a universal recipe that you can just sort of play around with, if that makes sense. Anyway, back to the colorants and some problematic math bombs. You see that? that that's a very, that one was not a lot of fun to mold, but it, it ultimately worked. You know, I scraped them back into their containers and took out a little bit from the inside and uh, tried the mold again. And it was fine. And we're going to see whether or not it survived, you know, the, the cure and the hardening here in a little bit. But more colorant options for your bath bombs. Really, you can use, you know, your, your dyes, your FD&C colorants that you get for, like, food coloring. I don't recommend it just because that's not what they're specifically used for and, you know, approved for. So, again, batch certification just to keep it legal on the up and up again. That's what you should do for your lakes and dyes. For your micas, again, you need to make sure that you are using micas that are approved for bath bomb use, for cosmetic use, for the same reasons. And uh, you can also do natural colorants. Uh, I would recommend, because there are a lot of really cool natural colorants that you can do that would come with an oil infusion, right? So we're talking about matter root, which would be a beautiful you know, thing to use, or uh, beet root, or yellow dock root. Uh, colors that will go really beautifully in bath bombs with an oil infusion. We will be doing a whole natural colorants deep dive either coming up right after this one or right after the next Project Soapway. So you can get more information on that. But at the end of natural colorants using essentially clays and, you know, the alkanets and stuff like that, you will be dealing with bath bombs that are, uh, well, pastel in nature. If you're ever really wanting to go really bright like this, realistically, the only way to do that is going to be using an FDNC or a liquid colorant. Back in the day, Brambleberry would sell what they called lab colors. And so essentially what it was, was a concentrated dye that they would send you in the form of like a half an ounce or a one ounce container that you then needed to mix with your uh, distilled water that was heated and then you had to put a preservative in it and it was fine-ish, you know, but in all actuality, it's kind of no different than just getting the FD&Cs because that's all they were, were FD&Cs 
and making them yourself. And for a cost perspective, it's cheaper to do it that way, to buy the powdered versions and make your own, than to get the lab colors from Brambleberry. I do not know if they even sell those anymore. But it's going to be very similar to the stuff that you get at the craft store. I mean, samesies. It's liquid colorants. They, the, the issue that you obviously run into is going to be the water content. So if you have too much moisture in the batch, like I did, you're going to have to uh, adjust to make sure that that moisture content is going to be good is to ensure that you're going to be able to mold the bath bombs. Again, always test this before you put the citric acid in to make sure that the moisture level is where you want because as soon as that citric acid goes in, any amount of water that you have within it, it's going to look to, it's going to look for, it's going to try to find. And so make sure that you have that dialed in and adding more baking soda or other dry ingredients before you put the citric acid in so you end up with a good bomb. This was the last bomb and I can't believe I managed to make it a whole one. And on to the uh, reveal of all of these. And again, these set up overnight. Uh, humidity level still around 50% with all of these. I will be showing you a higher humidity level uh, tomorrow or within the members only so we can see just how this recipe performs even in high humidity environments. But that is not this video. This video is colorants. And so, yeah, it ultimately depends on what it is that you're looking for. If you're wanting the color of the bath bomb or the tub water to change with your bath bomb, FDNCs are going to be the way to go, lakes and dyes. And, but if you have, you know, issues using those for all manner of reasons, there's lots of reasons to not, there's pros and cons to all, then you're going to look at micas. But the thing you need to keep in mind with micas is you can't use anything ultramarine. So you cannot use an ultramarine blue or a chrome green. And the reason for that is the acidity of the citric acid will produce, um, it's like sulfur off gassing and it's, it smells really bad no matter what, like no matter how much fragrance you put into it, the bath bombs themselves still smell really gross. So you don't want to use those. Uh, but there are a number of micas that are now blues and greens that are safe for bath bombs out on the market. I know Mad Micas has a number of them. I did that whole testing thing with, gosh, what was the name of that mica company at this point? And I tested all their micas. They had a lot of blues and greens that would work in bath bombs. So just do make sure that you don't use one that has ultramarine blue or chrome green um, and you should be good to go. Natural colorants again, just like with the micas, you're going to end up with more muted colors, certainly. And, but you are eliminating some of the problems that come along with uh, using FDNCs. So really does depend on what it is you are overall wanting to achieve with your bath bombs, where your company and your, you know, business and moral ethics and all the things lie in selecting all of them. There's also nothing whatsoever wrong with just using, you know, no colorant whatsoever and making beautiful white bath bombs. So there's that too. These particular ones, they're going to be a beautiful bloom. I'm super duper excited about this and to show you this one because they are incredibly bright and you can kind of see the pink coming through in that purple portion because I mixed the two. But yeah, ultimately with the colors, if you're using dry ingredients, you pay attention to it and adjust the moisture content accordingly. If you're using wet colorants, you do the same. You pay attention to the moisture content and you adjust the batch accordingly. Not an exact science. Uh, the moisture content levels, though, can be more exact. And so I'm very excited to have that weird test with you guys. And you guys can see how I test my moisture content to make sure the batch is good to go. But that's for another video. And there it is, a six-color rainbow bomb that is absolutely stunning. So gorgeous when it blooms out. You will get to see the bloom very, very soon. And uh, yeah, there's that. And more information about micas and how to use them. Or, you know, the, the lab colors from Brambleberry or any sort of liquid color generally. And the biggest takeaway with all of that is, A, you need to pay attention to your liquid colorants to see if there's not water in it, right? Because if there is water in your liquid colorants, you want to eliminate or reduce the amount of water that you're putting into your bath bomb batch, into your recipe itself. But two, if you can get away with using the liquid colorants like with glycerin, cutting it with glycerin, it's all the better because that can help out too. 
Putting glycerin inside the bath bomb can come with its own set of consequences though because glycerin is a humectant it can start to draw some more moisture into the bombs and eventually you're going to end up with fragile bombs. So that is something to keep in mind because we don't want them to be perfect for a few weeks and then just very very crumbly and falling apart in your hand following that. Next up in this series we will be talking about uh, more wet and dry additions for their oils as well as you know your emulsifiers, your surfactants and all the jazz to create foam, to create fizz, to create a better skin loving experience, all of the things. So stay tuned for that. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I am very much enjoying this. Uh, Sudzers, I hope you guys specifically are enjoying this. I miss you. I have not been able to be in the Discord for like an entire week, but it is just so crazy right now and I just don't know what weighs up. So thank you for understanding and for being you. Um, I think we have like two days left before the wood grain challenge is due. So I hope you guys are having fun with that. I'm going to go, but I will see you in the next video of the bath bomb back to basics tutorial deep dive playlist thing of soapy fun. Bye.